Dr. Chris Scott, um, who is an FOP expert from South Africa, actually did an incredible presentation for the families on clinical trials, helping them understand what trials, studies and trials are, your role in those, in those programs, um, your responsibilities, the role and responsibilities of the pharmaceutical companies or the institutions that are sponsoring those trials and studies. So we just, like, as he was doing it, I'm texting, like, we want you to come and do this at the family gathering. And other people that were there are nodding too. It was so great. So with all that buildup, now the pressure is really on Dr. Scott. So come on up um, and please help me in welcoming Dr. Chris Scott all the way from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, thank you very much. It really was a, a bit of an elaborate uh, introduction. I'm sure I'm not half as good as Michelle made me out to be, but I am very, very happy to be here and uh, to be back in this wonderful country of yours. Um, and she's, uh, as Michelle said, uh, uh, the, the talk originated because of the advent of clinical trials. It's becoming really important that you as patients know what you're in for and try and understand better what's going on. Um, and so this talk is in, in basic language that we can all understand, and, but its primary function really is to protect you. As soon as I figure out which button to press here, that'll move on. So that's where I come from, that's Cape Town. Um, if there's no one from South Africa here, so I can quite happily say that this is the uh, uh, best uh, city in South Africa. I was just wondering if my South African colleague is here. No, she isn't. So definitely the best city in South Africa, uh, the most beautiful as well. And uh, I work in this hospital, which is situated on the other side of the mountain, the other side of the mountain, the other side of the mountain. And that is the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital, which was built uh, by veterans returning from the Second World War. So I think I've covered a bit of the introduction, but what I want to tell you about is the thinking behind clinical trials, uh, why we do them in, in such a specific way, uh, want to explain exactly what a randomized controlled clinical trial is. Uh, what does a real clinical trial look like? Uh, unfortunately, there are people who do research that, that, that don't do proper clinical trials, and you need to be able to protect yourself and identify those for yourselves. Um, and what does a, a bad clinical trial look like, therefore, and how can I make sure that I'm protected during a trial? So imagine this scenario, this very trustworthy-looking doctor, a little, a little bit like me, uh, do you suffer from painful lumps in the back? Uh, I have just the thing for you. Uh, it works for everything, from heartbreak to psoriasis, and uh, it'll certainly work for your painful lumps. And the astute patient says, well, a little bit suspiciously, well, how do you know? And he says, well, I've been prescribing it for years. Here, ask this guy. So there's the other guy. He says, oh, yes, I've had it as well. It works wonderfully. Um, I've never been better. Uh, and the baby's like, well, what's, what's the catch here? And the doctor says, that's the best thing. There's no catch. There are no side effects. Uh, but let's just talk about that later and let's talk about how much you need to pay me to get onto this clinical trial. So the amazing thing about this is that our young friend in blue there wasn't lying. He did feel better after he got these tablets um, because some people feel better when they get medication that isn't really medication at all and that's because of something we call the placebo effect. So the placebo effect is a really fascinating thing. Um, it uh, it, it, it's a word we use to describe the effect of a fake medicine actually inducing a response. And maybe you don't have to be a doctor to understand how powerful this, this, this uh, effect of placebo effect is. If you're a mother or you're a father or you've got grandchildren and your grandchildren stub their toes and you kiss it better, that's what you're doing. You're using the placebo effect to, to fix that for them. Um, I was visiting friends in Washington before I came to this meeting, and the little girl bit the inside of her cheek. And her mother said, uh, there's no way to put a plaster on that. She said she insisted she needed plaster. We put the plaster on the outside of the cheek, and she felt much better. So the placebo effect is really powerful, and we all use it. Um, and it's been used for centuries in this way as well. And this may be something we're not very good at as doctors, is actually enhancing or using the placebo effect as well. It's not to say that placebo is a bad thing. Placebo can really make people feel better, and we should actually be using that. In fact, people have been using it for centuries, as I said. And Thomas uh, Jefferson wrote about this thing that he called the pious fraud of placebo. And he said uh, uh, that in speaking to some of his most successful physicians, they assured him 
that he used more bread pills, more drops of colored water, more powders of hickory ashes than all of the other medicines put together. Um, and then that was in 1807. So people use the placebo effect and maybe, I'm just putting it out there, a lot of the alternative therapies that people find so effective anecdotally uh, enhance the placebo effect and are therefore quite useful and helpful for them. There are lots of different types of placebo effect. There's the, there's the regression back to the mean. So that means if you get a cold, I can predict that you'll be better in four days. And if I give you a tablet on the morning of the fourth day and you feel better by lunchtime, you'll, you'll think it's my tablet that's done that. That's, so many diseases like FOP have this flare up and settle down, flare up and settle down thing uh, pattern. And if you uh, employ agents that make use of that cycle, you can, use the, you can get placebo effect and you're not really knowing if it's the tablet that's working or if, it's the, uh, placebo, or, or if it's the placebo effect or regression to the mean. There's confirmation bias. There's this uh, concept that because you are expecting to feel better, you look for signs that you might be feeling better. And lo and behold, when you start looking for things, you find them. So you see that all the time. You think to yourself, I'm in America. We don't have any electric cars in South Africa, and the first Tesla I see, I'm, oh, that's a Tesla, wow. Oh, suddenly I see another one, and another one, another one. Suddenly it feels to me like everybody in America is driving a Tesla, and that's not true. It's just because I've got this confirmation bias because I'm busy looking for Teslas mm -hmm. or Ford uh, Volts or whatever you call these, uh, Chevy Volts and, and these kinds of things. So that's confirmation bias. In the same way you can start looking for signs of feeling better, you find them. There's also the expectation that you'll get better. Our doctor said to his patient, you'll feel much better. And the other patient said to him, you'll feel much better. And you know, thank goodness, because I'm really wanting to feel better, I'll start feeling better. Um, and then there's social learning. People see other people getting better from things. So Facebook and media, uh, the social media that we're all engaged with these days, you see people are getting better and uh, you learn to kind of feel better. It's the same way that if you're a South African and you're watching your cricket team lose, Year after year after year, you kind of start losing your own squash games because you feel, because you learn to lose, unfortunately. Um, but, but that is the real thing. And then there's just the human connection of, of getting placebo sometimes. Sometimes just having someone listen to your story and reach out and make that connection uh, is enough to make people feel better. And, and that is not to be uh, snuffed at, of course. That's something that we should actually use more. So how do we make sure that when we give you a tablet, none of those things are happening. You can come to my office, uh, you might, might think I'm a great uh, physician, and therefore, the, just the mere fact that I'm giving you a tablet might make you feel better because of the placebo effect. So how do we protect one another from having this effect, and how, therefore, how do we measure if the fantastic medicines that are being developed are actually effective? Well, you pick two very similar groups of people, and you have to make sure that they're similar, both in terms of age, sex, size, Etc. Any factor that could influence the outcome uh, of, of, of whatever thing you're trying to measure, you should be controlling for. That means you make sure that the two groups are exactly the same by doing statistical analysis to see that there is no significant difference between the two groups in any other characteristic that, you're trying, that you think may influence the, the study. You then measure everything about these people as well as you can. Uh, document absolutely everything, and many of you are going through this, and you must be asking yourselves, do you really need all this information? When, but it's really important because we need to be able to identify everything that's different between the groups. And then you give one group a test drug and the other group a placebo drug. So you give an active drug and the placebo drug, and then you measure the effect really carefully, usually with hopefully something that's completely obje objective and not subjective, so something that that, that, that can't be uh, just an estimate, something that's really hard and straight and easy and scientific to measure very accurately. And that way you know whether your trial's working or not. And you have to do all of this while keeping the primary reason uh, any of us are in the room as doctors here is to keep our patients safe and to make their lives better. When we become doctors, we swear that the first thing we will do is do no harm. The last thing we want to do is cause anybody harm in applying our practice. And so the the, the overarching responsibility for all of us is to start, uh, is, to, is to keep you safe. And we do that by starting our testing on animals, and then we test healthy humans, and then we test a small number of patients with the disease, and then we test a bigger group of adults with the disease, and then only do we go to the most vulnerable society, or in, in society, and that's the, the children. Um, 
it's kind of like if you're buying a new carpet cleaner, you don't walk up to your Persian carpet and upend the whole bucket onto the Persian carpet and then go, ooh, you know, colors are running a bit. You start with a little spot in the corner and you clean that spot, and if that looks all right, you might try a bigger spot, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same way. You can't just test things on large groups of people. What if they all get sick? And that's where this terminology of phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four comes in. Uh, so phase one is, is starting with healthy volunteers. I was a medical student, um, an impoverished medical student, as most medical students nowadays are, and uh, I, I was a healthy volunteer for, for some of these um, for, for some of these drugs, it paid really well to put your body on the line for science. Uh, but uh, so you get healthy young volunteers who weigh approximately 70 kilograms and are approximately 174 centimeters in length, and you try and measure that in those healthy individuals and see if there's any danger signals coming back. Then you check for efficacy in a small group of people who have the condition that you're trying to look for. So in the case of FOP, you'd find FOP patients and see just for in a small group of them, are they getting better with it? And then you go into bigger groups, and eventually you try and measure all the uh, a large group of, of, of people. Once the drug is even in production and people are getting it prescribed, you can continue monitoring for safety so that you can make sure that there's no signals that come for safety after 5, 10, 20 years. And that's the advantage of things like registries. So why do we call it a randomized placebo-controlled trial and double-blinded controlled trial? Because at the beginning, we, we don't want to choose which patient goes on to uh, the drug and which patient goes on to the placebo. Because if we had to choose, I tell you, we'll take all the well people and put them on placebo and all the sickest people and put them on the drug. That's Even if we try not to, secretly in our hearts, we're going to do that. So we, we, even the doctors can't know which drug they're going to give you. And the same reason, and, and as, I, as I've explained about the placebo effect, it doesn't help you to know that you're getting the active drug or the placebo because that'll influence the way you respond and the way you feel on the drug. And you might report an improvement when it, just because you think you're on the, on the real drug. Um, and this is all done randomly by computer systems nowadays. I'd love to tell you that we sit and roll dice uh, when we decide who to put on which drug, but we don't. We do plug it into a computer and it's all centralized and, 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 and it's completely random and, and both the patient and the doctor are therefore blinded and then you measure all the outcomes. So the words that get used a lot in, in clinical trials are things like enroll. That, that's really the whole effort of being put onto a clinical trial is being enrolled onto a clinical trial. It always sounds a bit military in a way, um, but so it's not a forced thing, it's something that you voluntarily do to be enrolled in a clinical trial. The investigator is the doctor studying the drug, the sponsor is the company that's making the drug, supplying the drug, or funding the study. Yeah. The informed, signed informed consent is a very important thing, and that's the beginning of a clinical trial for you, is actually signing that you understand everything about the clinical trial and that it's all been explained to you very well. Uh, we call the people who participate in clinical trials participants rather than, than patients. Um, and you'll have heard about IRBs and, and, and ethics committees. These are the institutional review boards and ethics committees are the people who check that the clinical trial that's being done is safe, is ethical. That means we're not doing anything wrong. Uh, that means it's that your uh, and that, that your safety, your privacy, and a whole bunch of other things uh, are, are protected when when you're participating in the trial. And that leads me to the concept of good clinical practice. Good clinical practice is a set of guidelines for how to run a clinical trial that every single person involved in a clinical trial must abide by. Um, every every person who is involved in in a study in any way in the study, from collecting data to, um, to giving the medicine to taking blood, that person needs to have completed a good clinical practice certification so course or, or get the certification. And the main reason is that we need to look after the rights of children. Um, the, but it also means that if someone's doing a clinical trial and we know that the clinical trial is being conducted properly and we know that person has GCP or good clinical practice credentials, we can believe what they tell us about the trial when the trial comes out. Because we know they've abided by these rules, their results become more trustworthy at, at the end of it. Um, and so it's a very, very important part of clinical trials. Um, not sure why I did that animation. It's very sexy, but it's kind of useless. So, and everybody has to do um, a GCP. So if 
Dr. Kaplan has to do a GCP. I mean, uh, there's, no, there's no discriminating. The most senior person in the world uh, doing a clinical trial needs to prove that, they can, that they've done a GCP certification. And even that shady looking doctor over there needs to do GCP if he wants to do clinical trials. And so the main reason for that is because of the patient safety, you are number one. And why do we even have it? Well, it turns out that our history is unfortunately littered with people who didn't practice good clinical practice guidelines, who behaved very unethically. Uh, for instance, in the Second World War, testing the natural course of tuberculosis by deliberately infecting people with tuberculosis and then watching them die. Uh, that kind of study uh, was what prompted people to say, look, we really can't afford to, 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 to have a situation where this kind of thing happens. Uh, and that led to the development of a good clinical practice. So that's the last few slides, and I've gone probably way too quickly, um, is how do you spot a safe trial? Well, the first thing about a safe trial is that it's open. All the information is available to you. Uh, there's nothing that's secret. There's nothing that's hidden. Um, there's nobody can tell you if any question that you have about that trial, you should be able to ask the, uh, the investigator or the sponsor, and they have a duty to tell you everything about the trial. They can't keep secret from you the fact that when they tried this drug in, in, uh, in another disease entity, everybody in the trial developed cancer, for instance, or, or, or someone fell ill. All of these things need to be communicated to you and everything is open. There certainly will never be a situation where someone says to you, we're testing a drug, but we can't really tell you what it is. That's different to using a placebo. A placebo, you know you're either getting placebo or the drug, but you know what the other drug is that you're potentially getting. You know everything about it. If someone says to you, I'm gonna do a clinical trial, but it's a, my top secret thing that I've designed myself that I'm gonna give to you, it's a real danger sign. Um, and for that reason, there's a lot of information that, that goes around a clinical trial. And those of you who've participated, you sometimes feel drowned in information. And we as doctors feel like we're drowning you in information. And sometimes we feel we're scaring you with all the information that we're giving you, but it's, because we need to be open and fair and honest with you that we give you information that sometimes is a little bit scary and sometimes hard to interpret. You need to sign a good informed consent. Another way to spot a bad clinical trial is if the consent form is two, uh, you know, a page and a half long or a paragraph long, uh, that's, a, that's a very bad consent form. Consent forms should be long, they should be fairly complicated, they, sh or they should give you a lot of information without necessarily being complicated and your children should be if they're at the age where they can read, should be, read, be given consent forms that they can read, and these are called assent forms so that they can agree to participate in clinical trials on their own, as, the, as their own choice, uh, they can decide whether to be part of it or not. And they need to be informed at the age appropriate level uh, for them to be able to feel comfortable entering the trial. Um, most clinical trials are all really top clinical trials, or the good ones, are registered on a, on a website called clinicaltrials.gov. That's a website that originated at the NIH here near, near us in Washington, and um, uh, that keeps a register of all the trials that are happening everywhere in the world. So if you have any questions about whether your trial is a real trial, one of the first things I would do is go and look on clinicaltrials.gov. There, uh, there are mechanisms to make sure that the that when trials are registered there, there are mechanisms to make sure that they're done in the proper way. Um, people who put you on clinical trials are not allowed to make you promises. They're not allowed to tell you, you will certainly get better from this. And uh, uh, because the point of the clinical trial is that we're testing a drug that we don't know if it's really gonna be as good as we think it is. And we don't know if it's gonna be, have bad side effects for you. We can't promise you anything except give you the rationale for why we think it might make things better for you or your child. So promises are a danger sign. No guarantees um, and no incentives. Uh, nobody should say to you, if you take my clinical trial drug, I will give you so much money uh, and let's see how that goes. So that's again different to when I was accepting money for volunteering for clinical, um, for not clinical trial work, but for, for, fa yeah, for phase one clinical trials. That's different. Once you get to, to testing an actual drug on patients, no one should be charging you for it uh, or giving you money for it and no one should be uh, taking money th from you to participate in a clinical trial. And certainly no one should ever threaten you in any way during a clinical trial. You should um, 
maybe it's the frequency of my voice. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. You should be able to. Um, uh, you should be able to step out of a clinical trial at any point, should you wish to, and no reasonable ethical doctor would, sh would be allowed to say, well, if you step out of this clinical trial, then I will not see your child again. Or if you step out of this clinical trial, bad things are going to happen to you. Uh, that, that certainly shouldn't happen. A doctor should allow you to leave a clinical trial and should carry on treating you just as you, they did the day before you entered the clinical trial. So threats are a real, a real sign of danger. So what kind of questions should you be asking of your doctors when they put want to when they offer to enroll you in a clinical trial? Um, you should ask them why do you think this will work? Is this just some harebrained idea that you have, or is there some kind of rationale behind this? Can you explain to me why you think scientifically this might work? Um, are there other options? You know, you don't want to go into a clinical trial for a drug necessarily. If there's a perfectly adequate drug already available to treat your condition, and you need to be allowed to make that decision, and, 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 and you should be given all the options to explore all the therapies that are open to you. So a doctor should never hide one therapy for you so that they can push you to get into a clinical trial. You should know whether it's a placebo-controlled trial, because you should know that you run the risk of entering the trial and then not getting any of the effect of therapy. And, and, and that's your... You know, you need to be going to that with your eyes wide open and understand that part of the, of the study. Um, often placebo, there are phases in a trial where you'll have placebo for one part and, and then you get converted to the active drug. So you, but you need to understand when and how that's going to happen and whether it's going to be a flare that pushes you over, whether it's just a certain amount of time that needs to elapse before you go on to place, uh, from placebo onto open, open label drug. Um, you need to understand how much blood is being taken, what it's being taken for, how many times, if you've got a small child, you need to know exactly how much blood. Uh, a good consent form will tell you we will take approximately one teaspoonful of your blood every time you come and visit, for argument's sake. You need to understand those details, and you need to know what they're doing with your blood. Are they gonna store it for genetic research in the future? If so, there probably needs to be an additional component to the consent form to allow you to give them permission to store your genetic data, because genetic data is incredibly powerful and incredibly uh, valuable. Um, can I take any other medication with this trial medicine? You're not allowed to jump between trials and say, I'm gonna do this trial today, and if it doesn't r fit me right, I'm gonna move on to the next trial. There are mechanisms by which you can move between trials probably, but you certainly can't be participating in two all at once, or just be taking the medic medication that the homeopath is giving you, uh, as well as other medication without having a clear conversation about what you're actually getting, um, so that people can, so that you can be protected from taking two drugs potentially that might interact with one another. Um, how long is the study? That's an obvious one. And can I stop at any time? And as I explained earlier, the answer to that question needs to be absolutely yes. If someone tells you no, you're, once you're in, you're in, and then it's, you know, pedal to the metal, and we're going to go until the study is over, you should be allowed to withdraw at any time. Um, and the other a very important question you should ask, uh, especially if, if, uh, if, if you come from a resource-constrained environment, is will there be any if this me medicine is effective and it becomes registered, will you keep giving me the medicine after the trial? Not all countries enforce that, not all countries need that, and uh, there are mechanisms in most well-developed countries for someone to take over the burden of paying for the medication or once, once the trial's over, but you at least need to be able to ask that question and, and decide um, whether you want to enroll in the clinical trial um, if, if there is no ongoing supply of medicine for you once the trial is over. So that's really my whole story. So I, if those of you who grew up in the 80s and 70s like I did can will remember He-Man He -Man and uh, his battle cry was, I have the power. And so you all have the power to, to keep yourself safe, understanding how, why it is we do it like we do and understanding your roles and responsibilities as well as ours and the sponsors and everybody else involved. So thanks, I'm happy to take questions. Once you leave a trial, can you decide to go back into it, or once you leave it, you're done? It's Usually, once trial. you leave it, you're done. It, uh, yes, I'd say once you're out, you're, you're generally out because it's because you're not coming in as a as, as 
you, you're coming in already different to every other patient in the trial. So that would confuse the, um, the, the outcomes of the trial, yeah. Hi, if you're enrolled in one trial and you want to move to another trial, is there a, a time period that you have to wait? Yes, very enrolling? importantly, and you need to find that out before you, before you make that decision because there's often a washout period. Uh, and in some cases, in some clinical trials, having been on a specific drug uh, at all ever might preclude you from, exclude you from going into another, another clinical trial. Uh, we see that sometimes in, in arthritis trials in children where um, if you've ever been exposed to a, to a specific drug, they won't, uh, the, the, the study will, the, the effects of that drug can be so long lasting that they wouldn't want to try any other medicine in case it's still an effect of that drug that's been used. So, but in many, most trials, there's a usually a washout period until they're sure that all the drug from the previous trials has left your system, then you can go into a, a new clinical trial if you qualify by all the criteria. But it's very important to know that part before you, before you move. And but when I say, you know, you can move clinical trials, it's really, try, try you know, we, it, it's really not good for you or for, or for the clinical trial to do that. It, it is absolutely and 100% your right, but I don't want to give you the impression that, that, that it is like, you can just walk into a shopping market and uh, uh, a shopping mall and, and pick and choose and pick up and drop things. Uh, that's really, increases the risk to you in, in some ways and, 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 and really affects the science of the, of the whole endeavor as well. So when you sign consent, the intention is that you'll stay in the clinical trial. But should at any stage you feel it's not working for you or you're unhappy for whatever reason, you are well, well allowed to leave. Yeah. Another question. Uh, so a question about the role of clinicians with clinical trials and you know, patient communities and trying to understand you know, what's the role of a clinician um, in a world where there are multiple clinical trials and ensuring that they're impartial and neutral? That's a very important question. So the first role of a clinician, as I said, is to do no harm. And for every single patient in front of you, you've got to work out the best thing for that patient. If that potentially involves offering for them to enroll in a clinical trial, that's fair. But if you can see that it's not in their be best interest to enroll them in this clinical trial or that clinical trial, that's as imperative, that, that's an important imperative for you not to do so. So the best interest of the patient is always the one and only consideration that should be on the mind of the clinician. I guess the follow-up is, is how can they make that recommendation when they may not have data yet? Yeah. And so, and, and then the follow-up is, is how do you, you know, present yourself so that you're not perceived as recommending one over another and just letting the data follow, you know, you should just follow the data. That, and that's, that's a very, very good question and it's an extremely difficult line to walk often and the only way out of that is open communication and saying there are four clinical trials at the moment, this is how this one works, this is how this one works, this is how this one works and to avoid at all costs the temptation to say my personal preference would be to go for this one or that or the other one um, and, but, but often patients pressurize us into saying, you know, which one would you use? And then, then it becomes difficult because a doctor might then be tempted to, to say, well, for, because of this characteristic of your disease or this characteristic of this drug, the fact that this one might be oral and your child is very young and hates medicine, you know, maybe you should consider that one. But usually you try and uh, have the conversation so that the decision comes from the patient. Uh, and it's absolutely not right for doctors to favor one trial over another trial. And if you get the impression that they are, you should be asking uh, questions if you, if you think it's without rational explanation. So it's all about openness and communication. Very true. I'll, I'll repeat what Mana said. She's saying that every single trial has very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. So it may be that you only qualify for one trial because some trials will only take children, some trials will only take people who haven't had X drug beforehand, some people will only take people if they've had a chickenpox vaccine, some will take it and never give it to you if you've had a previous history of having a kidney stone. For whatever reason, you might be included and excluded from a clinical trial. And it's the clinician's responsibility to, to communicate that to you um, so that in, in, in some cases that might be the only trial that's actually an option for you. Another question. How often 
do the subjects get the ongoing data? And at the end of the study, how quickly do they get the data? Do they get the ongoing data? How quickly do they get the end result, the subjects who are in the trial? That's, that's quite a tough question. Um, so it, it, first of all, I think it, go, it depends on each clinical uh, trial. There is an expectation th that if there are new, if there's new information that comes in on a trial, that you'll be reconsented. For instance, if, uh, if, if a particularly bad side effect has become known, um, that needs to be shared with you and you need to reconsent. So data will be shared with you in that sense and you've always got to be aware of, of any new developments that might place your you at risk as a participant. Um, um, and then uh, I think companies vary in terms of how they feed back data, um, uh, but it's usually through the mechanism of, 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 of uh, press releases related to, to actual um, published data. Does anyone want to update on that, Edward? Yeah. One, of the, one of the purposes of the clinicaltrials.gov platform is that also results of clinical trials be published in that platform um, for the whole community to have access. So clinicaltrials.gov sometimes may, may appear to be, and sometimes it is pretty technical, um, as you know, the years evolve, there's more concern about transparency um, across the industry. And clinicaltrials.gov is definitely um, one place to look as a repository. Other countries have similar repositories with the same purpose. Most of the time, the international trials that have other countries participating are also in clinicaltrials.gov. Now, what may be specific about companies is providing patients individual uh, um, details of their participating, participation in the study. It is not common that, that you know, in the end of the clinical trial, um, you as a participant get very much individual data um, about results of the study. Um, sometimes when it's a completely placebo-controlled trial where you only take placebo, only take the medication, the the investigator will inform you which group you had been assigned to in, in those most obvious trials and, and results. Um, but in the context of clinical trial development, um, the focus is, is responding the answer towards the drug and how it works in the context of um, a group of people, rather in terms of the individual results for that, that person. So I hope this helped a bit. No, that's a very good um, clarification, yeah. Whenever you get consented um, for uh, for a clinical trial, you if you have a concern like that, the 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 um, consent form will include the telephone numbers of uh, the IRB or the ethics committee, and so they, there's a mechanism. If you f suspect foul play or you have, if you have questions or you're not sure what's going on, you you can discuss it directly with the ethics committee. So most consent forms will have an ethics committee. Um, number on it, or they all should do actually. Uh, does anyone want to okay, add anything? Okay, one last to that? question back here. Questions are really difficult. Yeah, Starting um, to get a <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have worn a jacket. Yeah. I'll, tr I'll try to make this an easy one then. Okay. Um, if more than one family member has the FOP gene or a variation and they're all eligible for two or three, however many clinical trials were open at the time, um, as an investigator or a physician, um, would you prefer each family member to be on a different clinical study for comparison or the same one? Um, I, I think in that scenario, uh, my personal approach would be to treat each patient as an individual, um, bearing in mind that that then entails you considering the family relationships and the logistics of getting to three separate clinical trials for three separate uh, things, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't have an easy answer to that one, but I would say it's in the best, in you, you need to consider the best interest of each individual child, and that may include factoring in the fact that their parents are now going to 
have to be driving to hospital on different days, uh, potentially, or, 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 or be following two different protocols, uh, uh, and, th and that might really be quite difficult. So th I, that's probably a tough question. I don't know if one of the, someone else wants to help me with this one, mm -hmm. but I, I would say go back to basic principles and the, uh, consider the best interest of each child as an individual. Yeah. Probably a good follow-up question too for your meeting. Help me thank Chris Scott for being here. <laughs>